Hello and welcome to this week's Health Report with me, Norman Swan. And me, Tegan Tyler. Today, every parent fears their teenager will get mixed up with alcohol and illicit drugs. Is there a way of telling which kids are more at risk? The rising COVID cases in children. Why are some children seeing higher numbers of children in ICUs while others are not? New research sheds light on how easily the COVID virus can be spread even by those who are fully vaccinated. And who would have thought that pre-pandemic that the intricacies of mathematical modelling would become part of people's everyday conversation and widespread media coverage? The nation is hanging its hat on the Doherty modelling and the Prime Minister keeps doubling down on us, beginning to open up its 70% vaccine coverage of the adult population. Another model out today from the University of Melbourne suggests there's a path for New South Wales to be down to five cases a day by mid-November. And there's hot debate about whether exponential growth and high numbers in New South Wales have stuffed it up for everyone and all bets and predictions are off. The Burnett Institute has been uncannily accurate in its predictions of the current New South Wales outbreak. And one of the people involved in their modelling group is Professor Alan Saul, who's a vaccinologist and a mathematical epidemiologist. Welcome to the Health Report, Alan. Well, thank you for inviting me. So the current controversy amongst many is whether the New South Wales numbers matter and the decision to ease restrictions at 70%. What's your view? Well, um, I guess every time we hear this, everyone quotes the Doherty model and say, I'm going to be bold and also quote the Doherty model. Look, the Doherty model is quite clear is that there will be restrictions even at 80%. And in fact, I'm not sure that people understand just how intense those restrictions are that the Doherty's model's predicting. So with a reasonable assumption about the efficiency of case detection, the Doherty's model suggests that we would need about 30% of the time in a severe lockdown equivalent to Melbourne stage four, even with 80% coverage. This is not the sort of isolated maybe you know, lockdown here or there. And so there's a lot of assumptions see, behind that, but it's, it's really quite important that people understand that this is not, you know, lockdown free. So just explain what the restrictions are. So this is, is this in the event of, a, of an outbreak? Is, this what, is that what you're saying at 80% coverage? No, so the, the, the 80% coverage assumes, in the model, it assumes that, um, that the contact tracing is working partially effective as the words that the Doherty use. And so that is a really critical part of the of the model. And the amount of lockdown that's required varies tremendously as that efficiency of the contact tracing works. And so the model actually assumes that the contact tracing is as important in reducing the transmission as the vaccine is at an 80% coverage. And very small changes in the efficiency of that contact tracing really make a very big change in how much uh, lockdown we need to maintain COVID at low levels. And, and, and what sort of numbers are they talking about at 80% control? I mean, what's the, what's, what's the story around 80%? I'm sorry, just to, get, to be clear, yeah. I mean, are they talking about hundreds of cases a day in, in Australia, 10 cases a day? What's, what's the scenario that you say you're going to need quite significant restrictions at 80%? Yeah, so it's 80% vaccine coverage. They assume that at that level, that the contact tracing is 88% as efficient as the contract tracing was in Sydney last year at virtually no cases. And that's not with Delta. And so there's a number of questions then as to how do you figure out what the uh, efficiency of the contract tracing would be. And so one thing is that Delta has a shorter um, exposure time. So that already makes the contact tracing less efficient. The Doherty model also assumes that a larger proportion of the people will be asymptomatic. And that also decreases the efficiency of the contact tracing. We actually need people to be symptomatic to front up at testing stations. So both of those things, even before we start thinking about what the caseload will be, will decrease the efficacy of the contact tracing. And I think just how much that decreases is a worry, but a 12% decrease in the optimal contact tracing is what leads to a 30% of our time spent in lockdown. And that's before we start adding on the decreased efficacy of the contact tracing because the contract tracers get overwhelmed. 
Uh, which is what you're seeing now in New South Wales to a significant extent. So the implication then is if the New South Wales numbers are high, then case the contact tracing through no fault of the contact tracers, it's just that they've got too many cases to deal with, um, they, that goes down and therefore lockdown goes up. That, that would be the implication of your interpretation of the Doherty report. Which yes, is, exactly. Which is not what the Prime Minister or indeed Sharon Loon was saying tonight on PM. Yeah, well, I, I didn't hear what she had to say, and I'd be interested to catch up. But the, the problem is, with the Doherty model, and, and most other models, I might add as well, there's this sort of catch-22, that as the cases come up, then the contact tracing goes down. And because the contact tracing is a very significant part of controlling the outbreak, that as the contact tracing goes down, then the cases go up even faster, and then the contact tracing gets even worse. And that rapidly spirals then out of control. Um, and so that, that's where the worry is. It's essentially an unstable situation and you don't need a, a large increase uh, before there's a problem. The other thing, if I can just point out, is the Doherty model and uh, is really for the whole of Australia. And in fact, in the model, in the document, they actually point out that you need to consider what's happening regionally but the model doesn't address that. And so the model starts off with 30 cases in the whole of the Australian population, 26, 28 million that they're proposing. If we were thinking about what that means in Sydney with eight, well, with New South Wales with 8 million and Sydney with about 5 million, um, you know, we're, we're talking only, only 10, 10 cases. Um, that's tiny. And will New South Wales get back to 10 cases or indeed Victoria for that matter? Uh, well, um, I think it's a real, I think there is a problem. I'm reluctant to try to predict, you know, if I sort of came and said, oh, there'll be 10 cases on the 23rd December, I know I'm going to be wrong. I, th I think it's just fair to say at this stage that despite everything which has been thrown at the situation in New South Wales since mid-June, Remarkably, from an epidemiologist's point of view, there's been an absolutely consistent epi uh, exponential increase. It's been doubling every 10 or 11 days since mid-June. And it seems that nothing that's happened has really shifted that, that, that line. Um, and that's not what we saw in Melbourne. So in Melbourne last year, as new controls came in, that exponential increase had a dramatic shift in its slope. But that's not happening in Sydney. So that suggests that as more and more controls are coming in, that other things are becoming less effective and presumably it's the contact tracing. There so may where, be other so where does well. it end in New South Wales? I wish I knew that, Norman. I am hoping that, uh, um, that as the uh, vaccination rate goes up, as, as the Premier Berejiklian keeps telling us, that as the vaccination rate goes up, that that will have some impact. Um, maybe some of the more stricter controls that have just come in the last couple of days, like the, the curfew at night, will impact it. But there's a, there's a bit of a problem here. One of the things I've been looking at is not only is it remarkably how consistent the exponential increase has been over the whole of New South Wales, if you look at the exponential increase in smaller areas, so in the 12 high priority areas for the last month, it's been growing absolutely consistently with a doubling time of 13 days. In the areas that are not part of the 12, now the number of cases are lowering, but it's been growing there consistently with a doubling time of just under seven days for the last so, month. So it's growing faster in the neighbouring suburbs? Much faster, at twice the rate. And in fact, if you just extrapolate those lines out, and again, that's a rather dangerous thing to do, it'll, they'll cross in about three to four weeks. So it's like being in a parallel universe in terms of what um, you're hearing from Canberra and what, you, what you're telling me. Well, um, it is, yes. I mean, there's quite a disconnect. And I, I suspect that a lot of the people who are uh, um, making decisions probably don't understand the Doherty model that well. I mean, everybody's quoting it. Uh, but it's a really difficult document to go through. It's very complicated. I think I, I take my hat off to the Doherty people. It's a remarkably comprehensive document with a huge amount of information in it. But it needs some quite careful thought. Alan, thank you. We'll make get you back.
Yeah, well, uh, don't ask me. Oh, I'm not going to give you a prediction, so you can't come back and ask me. I told you so. No, anyway. no, that's, I'm avoiding that. Press yeah. Allen, Press Allen so. Okay. Thank you. Professor Alan Saul is a mathematical epidemiologist and honorary research fellow at the Burnett Research Institute in Melbourne. You're listening to Aaron's Health Report. We keep hearing that the Delta strain of coronavirus